Hi everyone, welcome back to Ventilator Engineering. Last time we talked about how to spec flow control components, and today we're going to talk about how to spec all of the different sensors that you might need in your critical care ventilator. So this is things like O2 sensors, pressure sensors, flow sensors, and temperature and humidity sensors. Um, so specking some of these will be easier than others. Um, in particular, um, we've been seeing pretty serious supply chain limitations with the flow sensors, but we're going to work through all of those and talk about that later on. So um, to review from last time, we have this simplified block diagram of what the typical critical care ventilator workflow looks like. Um, and last time we talked about some of the flow limitations within this circuit. Um, so we talked about how by the time the airflow is supplied to the patient, we're operating within a range of um, zero to around 0.6 PSI. Um, we also have pretty high airflow within the range of 60 to 120 standard liters per minute. And depending on where you are in the circuit, um, you'll also be boosting up the heat and humidity of the air to 100% relative humidity at 37 degrees Celsius from that humidification system. Um, so you really need to be mindful of these things depending on which, uh, which of the various sensors you're going to be specking for. Um, for instance, if we're looking at sensors here on the inspiratory side of the circuit, I may not need to spec for the high humidity levels because I'm still going to be getting the dried medical air supplied from the wall, right? So for today's purposes, we're going to be focusing on these few blocks. Um, here, we're going to have the inspiratory sensors um, just at the outlet of the device internals, essentially. Um, we may also have sensors at various locations along the respiratory circuit. We may have sensors on the proximal side of the circuit near the mouth of the patient. And we may have additional sensors here on the expiratory end, and this is typically where we'll have, um, in particular, flow sensors and maybe pressure sensors. So, um, so this is really what we're working with today. Um, so let's first review which sensors we need for effective ventilation and why. Um, so the first one are these oxygen O2 sensors. And these are in particular for monitoring FiO2 from the gas blender output. Um, so FiO2, if you don't remember what any of the words in bold mean, you can review my first video in this series. Um, FiO2 is fracture, fraction of inspired oxygen. Um, so I'm operating under the assumption that there will be a gas blender at the wall of the hospital where the medical professional can set a value manually from 21 to 100% O2 concentration, and all I need on my device is a display of that oxygen concentration. I'm not using the oxygen sensor for any part of the control of my device. I just want some feedback for the user to understand what the oxygen concentration level is. Okay. Additionally, I'm going to need some pressure sensors. Um, so if you remember from my last video, uh, our primary goal is to maintain this type of characteristic waveform, so the breathing pattern as a function of the user set parameters. So the user will be able to set variables like the lower pressure bound, the PEEP value um, here on the plot, that's around five uh, CMH2O. Uh, they'll be able to set values like the PIP, the peak inspiratory pressure, and uh, some parameters relating to how long it takes to inspire and so on. Um, so the pressure is usually going to be a major player in the uh, control framework, um, meaning how we're going to actually actuate the valves to get this characteristic waveform. Uh, but additionally, the pressure sensors provide a level of safety in the sense that they tell us a lot about how the system might be operating um, beyond what the controller is doing. So for example, if I get a low pressure reading, from my pressure sensors, this may indicate a disconnect of the respiratory circuit. Likewise, if I get a high pressure value, this may indicate tube occlusion. So the pressure sensors are very critical for safety in addition to the actual control. For similar reasons, 
um, we're also going, going to need flow sensors. Um, and beyond performing uh, part of the control, these are also essential for calculating tidal volume, which is um, something that we're going to want to monitor so that we're not overinflating the lungs of the patient. And finally, we're going to need temperature and humidity sensors. You may be able to only get away with the temperature sensor, depending on where you're operating. Um, but essentially, these are for monitoring your heated humidification system. For example, if we're working with a heated humidifier, um, you want to be able to monitor the air that's being supplied to the patient to ensure that you're not going to burn the patient's lungs with overheated air in the event of some sort of mechanical failure. Um, so these are essential, but again, they're not part of the control of your device. It's just a display you want to monitor for, uh, you want to output, and um, it may be incorporated in your alarm system. So let's first talk about the O2 sensor. Um, so here in my simplified block diagram, I'm going to be placing the O2 sensor within this first block on the inspiratory side. Um, I'm assuming again that the O2 is not part of the controller. I just want a straight display to the user and maybe we'll throw some alarms if the O2 level changes drastically. Um, but for the most part, the user will manually set the level and it won't vary too much. Um, so there's no reason not to put it here on the inspiratory side. Okay, so let's talk about these O2 sensors. Um, so they're distinct from what some of you may be familiar with uh, in terms of the automobile O2 sensors. Um, automobile O2 sensors are usually zirconia or titania based and those require that the sensors be heated to something like 600 degrees Fahrenheit in order to get a decent reading. Likewise, you probably can't get away with a lot of the uh, lower cost O2 sensors that come with Arduino sensor kits or something like that because they won't give you the range of oxygen concentration levels that you want to monitor, monitor for in the critical care ventilator application. Um, however, the O2 sensors that we'll be using are pretty similar, if not identical, to those used in scuba, scuba diving equipment. Um, so that's somewhere you may look for alternative O2 sensor specking options. Um, but I don't think you'll have a lot of trouble finding O2 sensors. The type of O2 sensor that we'll be using is an electro-galvanotactic fuel cell, uh, which gives output in the millivolt range. So it's basically like a battery. You don't need to supply any current to the device to get a reading from it. It's just continuously outputting. You'll see that when you order one of these O2 sensors, it comes in a little can. And because it is continuously operating, uh, that makes it a wear piece. So when I'm specking my O2 sensor, it's going to come with uh, some sort of operating lifespan on the data sheet, and I need to check for that. Um, Again, since these are wear pieces, they usually sell them as raw sensors, so there's no circuitry built into the piece. Um, and this may make them a little more difficult to interface with, but in the long term, it makes it easier to swap out new uh, elements as replacement parts. Um, so let's go online and try to find uh, an O2 sensor. And to begin with, I'll try to find the same O2 sensor that I've been working with here. So that's this. SS12A oxygen sensor. Um, you'll see that it has uh, the sensing port at the bottom with this grid-like pattern. And it additionally has a few Molex pins. Maybe I can pull this out. And you can see inside sort of what that looks like. Okay. So let's go online and try to source a medical O2 sensor. Now this is Pretty straightforward. Let's see, I've done it before here. Um, and I'm just going to sort of check around on these initial websites that come up. Um, and sort of the first things that pop up are O2 sensors that are already used in medical applications, uh, specifically for ventilators. Um, so the one that I purchased when I was initially specking sensors was this SS12A here. 
Um, so we're going to take a look at that and maybe then look for an analogous part that's not sold out. So maybe, maybe this guy. Um, so here's the one that I bought way back when they were still in stock. And if you scroll down to the description, it'll give you an entire list of medical applications that the device is already being used in, including some known ventilators, right? Uh, so we're immediately going to go to the sensor specs data sheet and see what we can learn from this. So here's this O2 sensor that I have. Um, it tells you that the electrical connector is this three pin Molex system. Uh, that's the same one that I showed you a second ago. Um, it tells you what the measurement range is. So we can go up to 100% uh, by volume uh, concentration. And then the next important detail we have here is the expected operating life. So like I said, these electro galvanotactic cells have a lifespan. And this one says that it'll operate for six years at ambient air. So as a function of the chemical reaction that's um, occurring within the cell, if I boost up the oxygen concentration for a long period of time, uh, this lifespan will actually shorten. Uh, so it's worth thinking about whether or not the lifespan that your part is spec for will be good enough for your application. But since these are commonly used in ventilators already, I'm not super worried about this lifespan, um, especially if I'm going to be making what I consider to be an emergency device. Um, likewise, it gives you additional information about the output signal. So these are going to output put within the millivolt range. Here it's 13 to 16 and a half millivolts. Um, and that's a very small signal. So whatever circuitry you have in place should be able to amplify this signal to some extent. So work with your electrical engineering colleagues and find a solution for reading this output. Um, and then it has a few other specs like the response time, the operating temperatures within our range. We're not going, uh, to very high levels here, gives you some information about the linearity of the sensor, and you can read through the rest of these specs to decide uh, if this is going to work for you. Um, notably, it also has uh, some of the material that's in contact with the media, and these are spec for medical applications, so again, we're going to be okay with this. So this is why I chose this particular O2 sensor. Um, but if I go back here, um, I can just arbitrarily pick one. And these are all probably going to work because I specifically looked for uh, O2 sensors for medical applications. Um, we can scroll down and see that, again, these work in a variety of uh, medical applications here. These, some of these also look like um, ventilator applications, but you can check all of those. And if I open up this data sheet, um, this one has a pretty similar three pin Molex like the one I have. Uh, the connector is a little different, but it's the same concept, same sort of um, measurement range. Uh, and if I look at the expected operating life here, it's a little shorter. So this one is only going to last three years in ambient air. Um, so that's a bit different, same operating temperature. You can read through the rest of the specs and see if this is going to work for you, but um, this I would consider to be a reasonable replacement part if I didn't mind the, you know, shortened operating lifespan. Okay, so that's probably good for O2 sensors now. I don't think you'll have any problem finding a good replacement part there. Okay. So let's continue here. Now let's look at pressure sensors. Um, so I also don't anticipate that you'll have too much trouble uh, specking a pressure sensor provided that you look at all the details as we've done before. Um, so in my block diagram, there are a number of places where pressure sensors might appear. Um, so you may have one here on the inspiratory side after whatever type of flow controller devices you have. And you may use that one in particular for safety reasons. Um, you may have pressure sensors here along the respiratory circuit. You may have pressure sensors here on the proximal side, although I wouldn't prefer to add additional sensors on the prox 
proximal end um, because the more weight you add near the mouth of the patient, uh, the more likely it is that the endotracheal tube will be disturbed. Um, additionally, we may have expiratory pressure sensors um, and we may rely upon these differential pressure differences to understand some aspect of our system. Um, so I have this little pressure sensor that I've specced for my application here. Um, you can see that um, a standard lure lock sort of fits around some of the output ports of this device. So that's pretty convenient for me. Um, yes, okay. I thought I had something else to say, but no. Um, so like I said, these will be a little easier to spec than other ones. When you go out and spec these parts, you want to look for a differential or a gauge pressure sensor because you really care about the difference between what's happening within the lungs of the patient to what's happening in the ambient. We don't care about a true absolute pressure in that sense. Um, and just as a general tip, if you spec for an analog sensor, you may make your life a lot easier downstream if you need to find replacement parts later on. Um, yeah. So as I've mentioned in previous videos, my go-to for electronic sourcing, especially during this COVID crisis, has been at mauser.com. They've been expediting a lot of orders, and that may help you as well. And to a lesser extent, places like Newark and DigiKey. Um, so let's go to Mauser and see if we can run through that process and find um, a pressure sensor that could work for your application as well. So here's how we're going to do that. Just going to go to Mauser. And we're going to type pressure sensors. And immediately, this is going to give me on the order of 20,000 results. So we're going to have to narrow it down to some extent. And the first thing I'm going to narrow it down by is the pressure type. So I said that I don't really care about absolute pressure as much as gauge and differential pressure. So here I'm going to narrow it down by those categories and then apply the filters. We'll see what it gives me here. Ah. So I still have 5,000 results to work with. So the next category I'm going to narrow it down by is the output type. So I'm hoping, for my purposes at least, uh, to get a sensor that outputs within the 0 to 5 volt range. Um, maybe you have different preferences, but in particular, I'm specking for something that will work with a system on a chip, like a Raspberry Pi. Um, so it'll help me a lot to have outputs within this range. So Sometimes you can search for uh, linear specifications to get this range. You may also look for um, analog and maybe any of these. Technically, it is an amplified signal. Uh, but any of these categories, I think, will narrow it down in the way that I want it to. You can ask your electrical friends for help if required. And I still have almost 3,000 results. So finally, what I want to do is narrow it down by the operating pressure. So if you scroll down here, you'll see that none of these pressure ranges are really standardized. They have far too many parts to make this reasonable. So I'm going to skip over the bar section because that's sort of most of these will be outside of my range. And um, you can do this in a more systematic way. But for now, I'm just going to check out these pressure categories up to 20 or 30 inches H2O. Because if you remember our specs, um, we want something that works up to around uh, between 40 and 50 centimeters H2O, um, and these are specced within inches. So I'm going to apply these filters and see what I get here. Um, so most of these sensors are going to be made by companies like Amphenol or Honeywell, and we get a bunch of different options. Um, I don't think you're going to have too much trouble finding pressure sensors. And for that reason, I'm going to focus on the part that I actually bought way back when I was specking sensors. Um, this one is out of stock now, but um, there will be some similar parts to this one that you can look through on your own.
Um, so let's see what this one has to offer. Um, so here's my little Amphenol sensor. It goes up to 20 inches H2O. We can skim these sheets, but normally the specs, normally I just go right to the data sheet. And here we are. So um, if you're interested in the circuitry, all of that stuff is there. Um, the supply voltage ranges uh, on the order of 5 volts. Um, okay, and then here, here are the humidity li limits. So for my application, I'm specking this pressure sensor to be on the inspiratory side. So if I go back to my diagram, I'm looking for the pressure sensor that will go here before I ever get to the humidification system. Um, so I don't really care if I attain really high um, humidification levels uh, for this part specking um, application. Um, this one gets from zero to 95% relative humidity. Um, however, if I wanted to spec a pressure sensor on the expiratory side, I might have to worry about this non-condensing requirement. Okay, so that's worth keeping in mind for the pressure sensors, or maybe you'll just say, like, close enough, it's not technically within spec, but I'll empirically test it and see if it works. Um, so now I'm going to go and look up the actual part on this data sheet that I was looking at. And again, I can gain some additional information here. I already know that this operates up to uh, 20 inches H2O as a gauge pressure. Um, I can learn some additional information about the sensitivity of the sensor, uh, the linearity and hysteresis of the sensor, um, whatever else uh, you're concerned about in terms of sensor operations. But I decided that this sensor would work for my inspiratory side, so that's what we're going to go with. Um, but if you're if you have concerns, you can go on Mauser and other similar websites and spend a little bit more time looking around for that. Um, Okay, and the most challenging one we're going to <laughs> spend time thinking about will be the flow sensor. Um, so within the critical care ventilator application, there are a number of places where the flow sensor might go, um, really just these three. So here on the inspiratory side, we may have the inspiratory flow sensor. We may additionally have a proximal flow sensor, and finally an expiratory flow sensor. Um, now, the device I've designed only has an expiratory flow sensor, but then again, I'm relying more on a pressure-based control scheme. The type of control scheme that you choose will impact where you need these flow sensors to go. Um, I try to avoid having a proximal flow sensor because the ICU doctor we've worked with recommends that we avoid placing um, additional weight on the mouth of the patient. Um, Additionally, uh, commercial flow sensors may have temperature and humidity sensors built in, particularly on the proximal side. So if I were to go out and find a Sensurian flow sensor, under normal non-crisis conditions, um, they would try to sell these even in sets. Um, so they would sell uh, the inspiratory flow sensor with the proximal and expiratory flow sensors um, in these I don't know, groups of three, I suppose. Um, the inspiratory flow sensor is optimized for unidirectional sensing. Um, the expiratory flow sensor is effectively the same sensor. Well, I think I guess all three of them are probably technically the same sensor. Uh, the difference is that these two have different ports. So this is sort of like the male-female ports, and this one is the female-male ports in the opposite direction. Um, by contrast, the proximal flow sensor uh, is specced as a bidirectional sensor so that you can inhale and exhale through it and, as a result of this, detect when, for example, the patient is attempting to inhale or exhale to prompt the spontaneous breathing shift um, within your controller cycle. Um, so it's pretty handy to have a sensor here near the mouth, but again, it's worth 
thinking about if you want to add that extra weight. Um, yeah. So like I said, this is where you're going to encounter the most serious supply chain limitations. I may have gotten one of the last um, Centurion flow sensors, these proper commercial ones. Um, and you can take a look at what these are like. They've got this little uh, mesh-like grid on the inside with these fins farther back. Uh, and this is a MEM sensor. Um, so you'll ultimately want to spec your flow sensors for pressure, flow, humidity, like the other sensors. And because these work within such a very niche regime, uh, it's the super low pressure and the super high flow, uh, maybe with the humidity considerations. Um, these flow sensors pretty much only exist for these very specific medical applications. So you can understand that now that everyone's trying to build ventilators, they're in extremely short supply. Um, these type of medical flow sensors are distinct from the typical hot wire anemometers that you might find in cars. I have one of those here as well. Um, so in these devices, you know, you have your um, temperature sensors, your, you know, heating elements, and you're able to detect when um, the flow moves past the sensors as a function of to what extent the air has been heated. Um, but these hot wire anemometers don't necessarily work very well in these high oxygen environments that we have within the ventilator. So a lot of people are trying to find workarounds to this problem. Uh, and the most common one is this uh, sort of bypass solution. Um, essentially what you do is you design a tube um, in which you have a flow restrictor of some kind. That's essentially why we have this sort of fin-like fin um, insertion within this device. And then you have a narrow channel into which you can insert something like a differential pressure sensor uh, to get an estimate of the flow. Because if you know uh, additional characteristics of your device and you know the environmental conditions, um, like the width of the channel and the temperature of the air flowing through it, you can calculate the flow from, from that knowledge. Um, so the Princeton team has a group of physicists working on uh, a ventilator monitoring project, and they've created their own modified flow sensor using uh, the differential pressure sensor method. Um, you can see it here that there are these little differential pressure sensors sticking out of the device. And there's also a group at UC Berkeley who's making their own mod. Essentially what they've done is that they've um, come up with uh, a 3D print printable modification of the GE D-Light spirometer. Um, so basically it's a knockoff of an existing spirometer that's out there in the world. And they again have these ports into which you can put uh, a differential pressure sensor to get your readings. And this can work for effectively any arbitrary differential pressure sensor that meets these requirements. Um, so let's see, let's go to Mauser and see if I can find any, any sort of um, flow sensors that can work for our application. So if I were to search for flow sensors here, um, I'm going to, again, get a whole list of options that I might work with, but I'm really going to have to narrow these down to ones that will work with air and oxygen and other things that um, will, you know, be compatible with our ventilator. I may also add MEMS flow sensors because that's what I have here in the Sensurian part. So I'm going to apply these filters. Um, and I'm still going to have a rather large number of results. So here I may narrow it down to some limited pressure range. Uh, so there are a number of choices here. You can do this in a more uh, method methodological way, but I'm just going to choose a few that roughly meet our flow specifications. Um, so here this one is minus 10 to 240 standard liters per minute. 
Um, I may also, I mean, technically we want something a little higher than that, but let's just sort of get an estimate here. I'll apply the filters. So I think we're going to have a pretty limited range of options by the time we've narrowed it down this far. And you'll see that <laughs> all of the flow sensors that come up, for the most part, are out of stock. They have so many on order already. Um, so here's one of the Sincerian parts that they've actually started producing in response to the COVID crisis. It's like the lower end version of these fancy commercial ones. Um, and again, these are, <laughs> these have 100 on order. Um, but we can go on the Sincerian website and try to find uh, these analogous parts for your reference. I still think it's worth doing this so that you understand what a proper commercial flow sensor looks like and what the specifications for those ought to be. So on the Sincerian website, I'm going to check out their mass flow meters for gases. Already you can see that um, they're really promoting their devices for use in ventilators. You can tell that these have ports which connect to the standard respiratory circuit. Um, and here's the same one that I have, the 3200, but all of these parts, the, the 3100, well, not that one, the 3100, 3200, and 3300. Oh, these, okay, sorry, these have both. These two are effectively the same sensor. This one might be as well, I'm not sure. And then they have additional um, neonatal flow sensors, which will not flow enough um, for the adult ventilator application. Um, so we'll just pick one of these to check out the data sheet. Um, so here's this bi-directional MEM sensor that we're looking at. Um, because it's bi-directional, it's spec for 250 standard liters per minute in each direction. And then we can go check out the data sheet somewhere over here. And this will tell us everything we need to know about its applicability to the ventilator. Um, we looked at the bidirectionality, has a pretty small dead space, um, so you don't have to worry about pressure drops across this device. Um, it updates pretty quickly, um, so you can get readings from this device in half a millisecond, um, which is essential, especially if you're doing some type of volume-based control. You don't want to slow down your controller as a result of these sensor readings. Um, and it gives us additional information about pressure drop, accuracy, accuracy, accuracy shifts, um, and temperature ranges, and so on. But unfortunately, we're probably not going to be able to get any of those, so you may have to go through and create your own from differential pressure sensors or find some other workaround. Um, and finally, I'm not going to go into too much detail in terms of temperature and humidity sensor specking. Um, I think these are pretty straightforward as well. Um, so you may have ports that enable you to get these readings either on the Y or somewhere on the proximal side. Um, so either your Y splitter itself will have a port, or you can buy one of these adapters that has the port built in. I personally wouldn't rely too much upon the respiratory circuit being expected to have ports in any given location because these are consumable. Um, the folks in the hospital will be replacing the respiratory circuit every time in addition to the humidification chamber the HMEs, and any other disposable sensors that may need to go. Um, I wouldn't account on them having any given brand of respiratory circuit. So that's worth keeping in mind. Um, make sure your uh, sensors can interface with any standard ports and tubing in place. Uh, and I think you won't have too much trouble there. So good luck with all of your specking. I'll see you guys next time. Bye.